Thank you. Thank you so much, Brother Art. I appreciate your kind words. Scott, thank you for the marvelous music today. It was just absolutely wonderful. I love this church. I'm always happy to be here. have a lot of friends in this fellowship. I always sense warmth and conviviality when I'm here. And I think that's excellent because the warmth of this church obviously invites people to come in and experience the Lord in a meaningful and significant way. I tried to think today uh, and in the preceding days about what I would say to this congregation because I know that you've been through some challenges in recent weeks and months, and I just thought the thing to do would be to focus upon Jesus Christ, you know. Um, The name of Jesus is the most wonderful and precious name that I know. And I'd like for you to turn, please, if you will, to Philippians chapter 2, and I want to read verses 5 through 11. And let's just think about the name of Jesus. The things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So beginning in verse 5 of chapter 2 of Philippians, Paul says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross." Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May the Lord add his blessings to his precious word. Let's bow together in prayer. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for this Lord's Day, for this congregation of people, for this church, for the ministry of First Baptist Church of Ella J, for the leadership that you have provided. And Father, I pray that you'd pave the destiny of this church with your goodness and with your grace. Father, I pray that you'd help us to love you and live for you. I pray that you would forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for impure thoughts. Forgive us for walking in the ways of this world. Forgive us for listening to the counsel of the ungodly. Forgive us for drifting away from you when you seek to woo us with your love and grace. Forgive us for sins of omission, sins of commission, and sins of disposition. We pray, dear Father, that you'd help us to walk consistently with you, to love you with all of our hearts, all of our minds, and all of our souls. Teach us this morning from this passage of Scripture the things that we need to learn so that we may live more devotedly for you than ever before. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Many years ago, William Shakespeare asks the question, what's in a name? It's a good question. Did you know that until the 1100s, people only just had one name? It was not until the 12th century that we started talking about surnames or second names. And in the Bible, there are many people, particularly the men, who were just known by their one name and their parentage. For example, it's Abraham, the son of Terah. It is Moses, the son of Amram. It is Joshua, the son of Nun. It is David, the son of Jesse. And in the culture in which Jesus was born, names had great significance. Jesus, for example, means God is salvation. 
And so in that culture, children were often urged to live up to the name that they were given. Now today, names don't mean nearly so much, I suppose. We have a lot of common names. For example, Jim Smith is a very common name. It's a good name, but it's a very common name. Did you know that there is a Jim Smith Society in the United States? The qualifications for being a member is that your name must be James or Jim Smith, or you must be married to a James or Jim Smith. They just celebrated their 50th anniversary as a society. They did that back in November of last year. Their celebration was in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I've often wondered why they didn't have it in Smithfield, North Carolina, <laughs> or Smithville, New Jersey, or Smith-Ton, Missouri. But they had it in the place where the organization was founded. They have no causes. They do not take up any money. They have no religious or political affiliation. They're designed just to have fun. In fact, their motto is, we don't shun fun. <laughs> and they have a theme song. It can be sung to the tune of Old MacDonald Had a Farm. A Jim Smith here, a Jim Smith there, here a Jim, there a Jim, everywhere a Jim, Jim. Well... That's it. You know, there are a lot of common names in America. In fact, the top five most common names in America today, I understand, are Smith, Brown, Williams, Johnson, and Jones in that order. There have also been a couple of Hispanic names that have moved into the top ten in recent years, and those names are Garcia and Rodriguez. But common names are interesting even in themselves when you begin to think of it. I heard about this man who was in the front yard raking leaves one autumn day. And as he was raking leaves early in the morning, the paper boy came by and threw a paper in the yard that fell at the feet of the man raking leaves. He'd never met the paper boy before, and so he said, Son, what's your name? The little boy said, My name is uh, uh, George Washington. The man said, well, now that's a famous name, isn't it? The little boy said, well, it ought to be. I've been delivering papers here for two years. <laughs> but we're going to think about the most important name, the most significant name, the most wonderful name in all the universe, and that is the name of Jesus. Uh, first of all, I want us to think about the supreme position of this name. You know, Mary and Joseph, the earthly parents of Jesus, didn't give him his name. In fact, in Matthew 1.21, an angel came to Joseph and said, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And when Paul wrote the church at Ephesus, he was talking about the name of Jesus, and he says it's far above, not just above, but far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but in that which is to come. So as we think about the supreme position of this name, I want us to consider, first of all, that it is the most important name. Now, there are many important names that have been logged in the annals of human history from time immemorial, but there is really no name like the name of Jesus. Years ago, Dr. R.G. Lee, who was the pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, from 1927 until 1960, preached a sermon on the name of Jesus, and he said, when you think about great names in history, you might think of Demosthenes as being a great orator, but so was Homer. Or you might think about William Shakespeare as being a great author, but so was uh, John Bunyan, who wrote the world's greatest allegory. And, and so was uh, uh, John Milton, who wrote the world's greatest epic. Or when you think about composers, you might think about Beethoven as being a great po composer, but so was Mendelssohn. And if you think about great philosophers, you might think about Plato 
as being a great philosopher, but so was Aristotle and so was Socrates. If you think about women of compassion, you might think of Florence Nightingale as a woman of great compassion, but so was Mother Teresa. If you think about world conquerors, certainly there was Alexander the Great who conquered the world for Greece in his day, but there was also Julius Caesar who conquered the world for Rome in his day. If you're thinking about great athletes, you might think about Ty Cobb as being a great athlete, but there's also Michael Jordan. And in presidents, you might think of George Washington as being a great president, but so was Abraham Lincoln. The point is this. No matter what discipline or field of endeavor you may look into, you will find great people. But every great individual, no matter what the field of endeavor, has someone else in that same field just as good and just as great. But that's not true when it comes to Jesus. He is in a strata all by himself. He has no rivals. He has no equals. He has no peers. He is the unique virgin-born son of God. The Bible says that he's holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. His name is the most important name in the entire universe. Number two, it's also the most inclusive name. Now, you take my name, Gerald Harris. I don't know how Brother Art got so much out of my name, but I'm basically a husband, a father, a grandfather, a former editor, and a preacher of sorts, and that's about the end of it. But when you look at the name of Jesus, there is so much included in that beautiful name. In fact, Jesus Christ embodies all of the qualities and attributes of God himself. For example, the Bible says in Colossians chapter 1 that he is the express image of the invisible God. It says in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In other words, in the body of Jesus Christ, there were all the characteristics and qualities and attributes of God himself. Jesus himself said, I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end, who is and was and is to come, the Almighty. But for our purposes today, let's just take one book of the Bible and see what this one book of the Bible has to say about Jesus. Take the Gospel of John. In John chapter 1, he is the Word made flesh. He is also the true light, and he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In John chapter 2, he is the miracle worker who turns the water into wine at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. He is the discerner of hearts and the one who cleanses the temple. In John chapter 3, he is the herald of the new birth and the only begotten Son of God. In chapter 4, he encounters the woman of Samaria at Jacob's well in Sychar. And he declares himself to be a fountain of living water springing up into everlasting life. And in verse 42, he's described as the Savior of the world. In chapter 5, he heals the man at the pool of Bethesda on the Sabbath day, becomes known as the Lord of the Sabbath. And in verse 30, he's referred to as the righteous judge. In chapter 6, he takes the little lad's loaves and fishes, divides them, and feeds 5,000. And declares, I am the bread of life. In chapter 7, he's the one sent from God and promises to send the Holy Spirit to those who believe. In chapter 8, he encounters the woman taken in adultery, forgives her of her sin, and declares himself to be the light of the world and the great I am. In chapter 9, he heals the man born blind on the Sabbath day. Once again, is called the Lord of the Sabbath. In chapter 10, he is the good shepherd who knows his sheep by their names and declares, I am the door by which if anyone enters in, he shall be saved and declares, I and my father are one. In chapter 11, he performs perhaps his greatest miracle when he raises Lazarus from the dead and declares, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. 
In chapter 12, he is anointed with costly ointment by Mary of Bethany, makes his triumphal entrance into the city of Jerusalem, where he is held with hosannas as the king of Israel. In chapter 13, he girds himself with a towel, takes upon himself the form of a servant, washes the feet of the disciples. He also institutes the Lord's Supper, identifies his betrayer, and predicts the denial of Peter. In chapter 14, he declares, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And he also says, whosoever has seen me has seen the Father. In chapter 15, he is the true vine and urges us to cling to the vine because that's important for our sustenance and our livelihood. And he also says, I'm the one who would lay down his life for his friends. In chapter 16, he promises once again to send the Holy Spirit, and he says, be of good cheer, for I've overcome the world. In chapter 17, he prays his great high priestly prayer for his disciples and for us. In chapter 18, he is betrayed by Judas, falsely accused, brought before Pilate, who says, I find no fault in this man. In chapter 19, he is scourged, mocked, spat upon, ridiculed, crucified, and buried in Joseph's tomb. In chapter 20, he is raised victorious over sin, hell, and the grave. Praise his holy name. In chapter 21, he assists the disciples on a great catch of fish. And then he restores Peter's commission by saying, if you love me, feed my sheep. You see, Jesus Christ is the friend of the friendless. He is the lover of the loveless. He is the shepherd of the wandering. He is the desire of the disconsolate. He is the hope of those who have none. Dr. Lee said, if I had a hundred heads and every head had a hundred tongues and every tongue spoke for a hundred hours and they spoke only of the name of Jesus, I would never come close to exhausting the richness and the greatness of his name. And so his name is the most important name. It is the most inclusive name. And let me say it is the most irresistible name. Now, when you think about Jesus Christ, you think about him as being a man of humility, a man of selflessness, a man of sacrifice. In fact, in our text, Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. When you really think about those words, there's something about those descriptions of Jesus that just draw you to him. He is irresistible. And did you know that for 20 centuries now, people have been gathering, sometimes by the dozens, sometimes by the thousands, to hear the name of Jesus expounded upon. In fact, wherever Jesus Christ has been lifted up for 20 centuries, souls have been saved, lives have been changed and transformed, burdens have been lifted, questions have been answered, problems have been solved, relationships have been restored, churches have been revived, nations have been spared and delivered because his name is absolutely irresistible. Years ago, behind the Iron Curtain in Russia, there were a little group of Christians, 12 to be exact, who were meeting for prayer and Bible study in an abandoned warehouse. But after a number of months, word finally got to the KGB office about this band of Christians meeting in secret and praying and studying God's word. When they determined the location of these Christians, there was a captain of the KGB agents who sent four men to that location to exterminate those Christians. When they arrived on the scene, immediately there was a Russian with his back to each one of the four walls. And so the dozen of Christians, mostly elderly people, gathered in a huddle. And they knew that death was imminent. And they began to sing, there is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. 
It sounds like music in mine ears, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. One of those Russian soldiers said, wait a minute, guys. We don't need to kill these people. Surely there's more important work that we have to do. We need to let these people alone. They're just simply worshiping their God. They're not harming anyone. But the sergeant said, no, we have our orders. We've got to kill these people. And the first Russian soldier who spoke out said, well, I'm not going to be a part of their slaughter. I had rather die with them than be responsible for their death. So that night, there were 13 people who were slain, one of them a Russian soldier whose spirit had been set free by the irresistible name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought about the fact that the devil is preoccupied with the name of Jesus? He doesn't know what to do with the name of Jesus. He can't deny it. He can't ignore it. And neither can he resist it. So do you know what he's done? He's made a profanity out of it. I'm not a golfer. Golf spelled backwards is flog. <laughs> That's what I do to a golf ball. But several years ago, I went to play golf, and I got paired with two gentlemen that I did not know. One of them gave the appearance of being an outstanding golfer. He was dressed like a golfer. He had a set of expensive ping clubs. He talked a good game. He mentioned that he'd been in tournaments and how well he had done. And I was already intimidated because the only person I really like to play with is my brother because he's very forgiving of my wretched game. But we started and got on the first tee and the man with the ping clubs said, I'll, I'll set the pace for this team. And so he got up, took out his big Bertha driver and he took a mighty swing and he sliced his ball way into the woods. And when he did so, he said Jesus Christ in a profane way. And when he said Jesus Christ, I said, where, where? Well, he looked at me like I had smallpox. <laughs> he didn't say anything, but he began to make his way down into the woods to try to find his ball. Honest engine. When I took out my driver and hit my ball, it went straight down the fairway almost 200 yards. Nobody was more surprised than I was. On his second swing, his ball hit a tree and went back farther than it was before. And after about five or six swings, he finally got on the green and I was there waiting for him. And he looked at me and said, what do you do for a living? I said, well, I'm glad you asked me. I am a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It ruined his game for the rest of the day. <laughs> You know, if a lost person hits his thumb with a finger, he doesn't say, oh, Buddha. Or he doesn't say, oh, Muhammad. Or, oh, Confucius. But he'll take the lovely name of the Lord Jesus Christ in vain. And it grieves me that he does that. It just goes to show that the devil has got to do something with the name of Jesus. He can't deny it. He can't resist it. He can't ignore it. Because the name of Jesus is an absolutely irresistible name you take all the names of all the people who've ever lived and you pile it up until there's a veritable Mount Everest of names and you have to go far beyond that to find the name of Jesus because it's the most important it's the most inclusive and it's the most irresistible name in the universe now it's 1154 and I've got one out of three points finished But I'm going to condense the rest of it down, and I think you'll be proud of me by the time I get through. We've talked about the uh, supreme position of his name. Secondly, let's think about the supreme power of his name. And I'm just going to mention that his name has the power to do three things. Number one, it has the power to supply. 
to supply your needs. In Philippians 4.19, Paul says, For my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And Jesus himself said in John 14, 13, Whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now, I'm not an advocate of the name it and claim it, blab it and grab it prosperity preachers that you may hear on television or something. But I do believe that when you pray in Jesus' name and according to the precepts of God's word that God has promised to incline his ear toward you and grant your request. And I believe so often we walk around as spiritual paupers because we have simply not asked God to supply our needs as we need to do. So he has the power to supply. Number two, he has the power to strengthen or heal. You think about the healing that Jesus did when he was on this earth. He healed the woman with the issue of blood. He healed blind Bartimaeus. He healed the man at the pool of Bethesda. He healed the nobleman's son. He healed the centurion's servant. He healed the paralytic that was let down by the four men through the roof. He healed the young boy that had symptoms of epilepsy when he came down from the Mount of Transfiguration. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. I mean, you could go on and on and on and talk about the people that Jesus healed. Well, are the days of healing over in James 5? The Bible says, if any of you is sick, let him call for the elders of the church, and they will anoint him with oil in Jesus' name and pray over him, and the prayer of faith will save the sick. And I believe there are many people who get sick And because we have not sufficiently prayed for them, they do not get better. And I sometimes wonder how much better health the church would be physically, not just spiritually, if we would really sincerely pray for the sick as God has prescribed that we should do. So I think there's power to save, there's power to strengthen, or power, excuse me, there's power, first of all, uh, to supply, there's power to strengthen, and then there's power to save. We're sinners. First of all, let me just say that I believe America needs to be saved. America produces more pornography than any other country in the world. America aborts more babies than any other country in the world except for China. America has a dysfunctional government right now plagued by partisanship and pride. We have lost concept of making the Lord's Day holy in this country. And I could go on and on in that, but, about that, but America needs to be saved. And sometimes we get the idea that God is some kind of a benevolent grandfather, a benevolent Santa Claus who just wants to pass out goodies to everybody, but God is also a holy God, and he is a God of judgment, And he is a God of righteousness. And we need to understand that. Not only does America need to be saved, but people need to be saved individually. And you cannot go on in your gossiping, and you cannot go on in your lying, and you cannot go on in your cheating, and you cannot go in your adultery, and you cannot go on in your hypocrisy, and you cannot go on being a fraud without God's judgment. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the Bible tells us that there is salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. In fact, in Romans 10, it says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. Some people think there's salvation in a church. But may I tell you that salvation is not in being a Baptist or a Methodist or a Presbyterian or a Lutheran or a Pentecostal or an Episcopalian. I mean, you can be a baptized, catechized, organized, uh, recognized, authorized church member and be lost. Salvation is not in a church. And may I also tell you that salvation is not in a creed. I mean, you can know all about Christology, ecclesiology, eschatology, soteriology, pneumatology, 
And you can have your theology as straight as a gun barrel and still be lost. Salvation is not in a creed. And then may I say that salvation is not in a code. You know, there's some people that have their little system of ethics. And they say, I'll do this and I'll do this and I'll do this. But I won't do this and I won't do this. Listen, salvation is not spelled D-O. And it's not spelled D-O-N apostrophe T. It is spelled D-O-N-E. It's been done by Jesus Christ. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin sin has left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Salvation is not in a church. It's not in a creed. It's not in a code. It's not in a cause. I mean, you say, well, I'm marching for missions. Or I'm picketing for the truth. Or I'm uh, working for Jesus, or I'm campaigning for uh, righteousness. Well, you're not saved by a cause, no matter how noble it may be. You can only be saved by Jesus Christ. That's the only way you can be saved. If I were to ask you the question, if you were to stand before God and he were to ask you, why shall I let you into my heaven? What would you say? I was talking to a man one time and asked him that question. He said, well, you know, I'm a pretty good guy. I mean, I'm good to my family. I pay my bills. I I don't owe anybody anything. I'm as good as the next fellow. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. Are you as good as God? He said, well, no, no, I'm, I'm not that good. Nobody's that good. And I said, well, you're right. But I said, did you know that you cannot get to heaven unless you're as good as God? He said, what? I said, well, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 48, be therefore perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. He said, I don't get it. I said, all right, listen to me. I said, you are not perfect. I am not perfect. Jesus Christ is the only one who is perfect. And if he demands perfection, then we have not met his conditions for salvation. But if he is willing to transfer his perfection to us, and if we're willing to receive it, then Christ comes into our life, and when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sinfulness, but he sees Christ and his righteousness, and the Bible says we're accepted in the Beloved. And so, our perfection is through Jesus Christ. And so, if you have Jesus Christ, you can be saved. In fact, if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ, or if you're not sure if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven, I want to encourage you to trust him because Jesus not only supplies and he not only strengthens, but he saves. Now, here's the last point. Just sum it up. There's the supreme position of the name of Christ. There's the supreme power of the name of Christ. But there's also the supreme profession of the name of Christ. One of these days, every one of us and everybody who's ever lived anywhere in the world will bow the knee and say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Everybody. I'm talking about Osama bin Laden. I'm talking about Charles Manson. I'm talking about Suleimani. I'm talking about drug lords, mass murderers. I'm talking about gangs. I'm talking about pimps and procurers. I'm talking about hypocrites. I'm talking about everybody. One day, they will bow the knee and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what it says in this text that we read earlier. But some will be professing him in judgment. And some will be professing him in joy. If you trust Jesus Christ now, in that day you'll be able to profess his name in joy. But if you do not take advantage of this day of grace in which we can be saved and trust him now, in that day you'll bow the knee along with multitudes of people and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord acknowledging that he's exactly who he said he was. He's exactly who the Bible says he is, but it'll be too late for you to be saved then. So this is the day of salvation. Between 1900 and 1904, George Nash was the governor of Ohio. 
He dressed in a dark suit and a tie, and many people mistook him for a preacher because his demeanor and his voice just reminded people of a preacher somehow. But he was governor of Ohio. One day, there was a woman who came to his office to see him, but she didn't have an appointment. She spoke to his receptionist and said, I'd like to see Governor Nash. The receptionist said, do you have an appointment? She said, I do not. But I really need to see him. I'm desperate to see the governor. And uh, the receptionist said, well, I'm sorry. If you don't have an appointment, you won't be able to see the governor today. He's very busy. And the woman began to weep copious tears and begged for the receptionist to see if she could just have a moment of the governor's time. So the receptionist went into the governor and said, there's a lady here who is greatly distressed, and she wants to see you. Would you let her come into your office just for a moment? And the governor said, very well, let her come in. So she came in with tear-stained cheeks, and she said, Governor, my son is to be executed in the morning. He is to be hung for crimes that he has done. But he is the only relative that I have. If he is hung tomorrow, I'll have no one left in my family. And, and it's just good for me to see him every once in a while to know that someone in my family is alive. Someone in the family at least has some semblance of care for me. Could you possibly stay his execution or pardon him? And the governor said, well, I'm sure I cannot pardon him, but I'll see what I can do. So the woman left. Late that afternoon, the governor went to the prison. He was given the opportunity to go to the cell of this man who was to be hung the next morning. When he walked into view of this man, the man in the cell said, don't come near me. I don't want to talk to you. I'm tired of talking to people like you. And the governor said, but I may be able to help you if you'll give me a chance to talk to you. And the condemned man said, go away. Guards, take him away. I don't want to talk to that man. I've heard enough of his kind. Well, the governor left. The next morning, the warden came to escort the man to the gallows. And the warden said, did you see the governor yesterday evening? The man said, no, I didn't see the governor. Well, he came to see you. No, he did not. There was a man who came to see me, but he's like all the others, wanted to talk to me about God. I didn't want to talk to him. I turned him away. And the warden said, no, that was not a preacher. That was the governor. He came to talk to you about rescinding or revoking your execution. And the man began to weep loudly, and he said, oh, he came to save me, but I turned him away. That's what Jesus Christ came to do for you. I'm told that when the man was hung, the last words he said were, Oh my God, he came to save me, but I turned him away. Don't ever turn Christ away. Let's bow together for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I don't know whether there's anybody in this congregation today who would admit to being lost. But I do know that it has been often said that hell will be occupied mostly by religious people. And I recognize that we could be religious but lost. And so, Father, if there's anybody here today who's not absolutely sure of their salvation, I pray today they would open up their hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ and let him come into their lives so that they can be accepted by God in behalf of Jesus Christ who dwells within them. Save the lost. Help us to be concerned about the lost. Help us to be concerned about the name of Jesus. Help us to remember that as Christians, we're couriers of the presence of Jesus and that wherever we go, we're ambassadors of his. So Lord, help us to live like Christians. And for those who are not Christians, I pray today they'd be willing to walk the aisle, speak to Brother Josh here at the front, just say, I want to know how I can become a child of God. Lord, may it be so. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We're going to stand and sing in just a moment.
If you're here today and you're not absolutely sure that you're a Christian, number one, you have to admit that you're a sinner. We're all sinners. Number two, you have to be willing to say, I'm going to believe on Jesus Christ. I believe what the preacher said. I believe what he read in the Bible. I believe that through Jesus Christ I can be saved. Just believe that. And number three, come and confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. That doesn't mean you have to tell the whole congregation. You just tell Brother Josh here at the front. He'll be glad to relate that to us. Maybe there are others of you who need to come and you realize that you need to be a courier of the presence of Christ. I took German when I was in college and I discovered that the word for Christian in German is Nachfolger Christa. It means follower of Christ. It idiomatically translated, it means imitator of Christ. How many of us here today are really imitators of Christ? If you're not that, maybe you just need to come to this altar and say, Lord, help me to be an imitator of Christ. Help me to live for Jesus so that others will know that I'm his child. You respond as God leads you. Let's stand together and sing. And God, help you to come if you need to come to this altar today. Say yes to him.